I don't really have a presentation. <laughs> I just want to chat with you. I want to talk about some things that affect us in this time in which we live. You know, we heard this morning these hymns of the Reformation. And uh, we heard that Martin Luther was crawling up the La Santa Scala. Do you all know what the La Santa Scala is? That's that staircase in Rome. And as you crawl up on your knees, you come to plaques. And that's supposedly where the blood of Jesus dripped. Now the question is, what is the La Santa Scala doing in Rome? If this is the staircase that he was on when he was condemned by Pontius Pilate. And, uh, well, the answer is simple. This staircase actually was in Jerusalem. But the papacy had its seat in Rome. And so one night, miraculously, the angels took the staircase and transported it, and there it stood in Rome. One miraculous morning, complete with the blood that had dripped. And so they built a cathedral around it. And today, when you crawl up that staircase to this very day, I stood there and I watched these people. And my heart went out to them. I just couldn't believe that in our time and in our century, this could still be happening. And old and young, crippled and well, were crawling up that stair. And when they get to these places, they kiss, and up they go. And they can get up to 90-day indulgence for doing this very thing. And Martin Luther crawled up that stair, and as he was halfway up, this voice said to him, the just shall live by faith and he got up and the reformation started this thing called faith is something that's gone missing we don't have faith do you know the bible says that without faith it is what does it say impossible to please him without faith it is impossible to please him. That's rather sad. Romans chapter 14 says, Whatever is not of faith is sin. Wow. So I guess it's very important that we know what faith is, isn't it? If we want to know what faith is, we have to go to the Bible. And we read it in Hebrews chapter 11. Have you got your Bibles? You know, we're living in a time when people need all this electronic paraphernalia. Have you noticed that? Everybody needs electronic paraphernalia. Do you know what we need? We need this book. And if it's taken away from us, directly or indirectly, then we need this book over here. And so it's time we turned a new leaf, if you will excuse the pun, and we start using this book again. If you turn with me to chapter 11, it gives us the definition of faith. And I want you to, to think, we're going to do a very simple thing to this evening, this morning. Very, very simple. And I've spoken about this many times. But this is the hub, the crux of the matter. This is the dividing line between truth and error. This is the, the line between faith and presumption. It says now faith, you should say this off by heart. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now at nausea I speak about this. How can something have substance that you cannot see? Something that you cannot see doesn't have any substance. You can't touch it, you can't feel it, 
You can't hold it. You can't cuddle it. You cannot do anything with something that you cannot even see. But the Bible defines that something that you cannot see as having substance, being a reality, as though it were literally there. That's faith. Faith is the substance, the reality of that which you cannot see. And it is the evidence of things not seen. It's very important. It's very simple, but it's very important. It's the evidence of things not seen. I spoke about this last week. And I said, can any court of law allow evidence that has not been seen? What is the answer to that? No. No. You cannot have the witnesses roll in and say, this, dear judge, is what we did not see. He'll say, have you gone insane? Will you leave this court and stop wasting our time? Well, that's what the Bible says. It says faith is the substance, the reality, the tangible, the touchable, the feelable of what you cannot see. And it is the evidence of what you cannot see. It is evidence. Now, then follows a list of all the tremendous pillars of faith. And we'll look at the substance of these pillars. Now, please remember that without faith, it is impossible To please him. Where do we read that? We read that in verse 6. It says there, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Just grab all of that one. You must believe that he is. And you must believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, didn't we just sing a song about people going to the stake? Didn't we sing that? Here I go, I'm going to the stake. I'm going to burn. He's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Can you get those two together? By faith, you have to look beyond the present in order to grab hold of faith. Now, let's look at the great examples of faith in the Bible. And they're very encouraging. It says here in verse 2, For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. Let's look at this good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Let's just do that again. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. First example of what it means to have faith. Remember, without faith, it's impossible to please him. And whatever is not of faith is sin. Today, in the world, We have all these millions of people sitting in pews, sitting in churches, claiming to be Christians. And do they believe point number one of what it takes to have faith? Yes or no? What about the churches? Have the churches of the world embraced the first pillar of faith or have they rejected it? What do the synod decisions say about creation? 
Was it creation or was it evolution? The Roman Catholic Church has openly come out in support of evolution. The Reformed churches have openly in their synodal positions have taken the stance that we came about by evolution. So the very first injunction in the Bible regarding faith is gone. Wow. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gift, and through it he being dead still speaks. The offering of Abel was the offering of the Son of God. Today, Jesus is being sidelined and put on a par with every other deity on the planet, ranging from Zoroaster to Hindu deities to gurus, you name it, in the world. In fact, it is claimed that it is not the sacrifice of Christ which is required, the atonement is losing faith, faith in the world. We just have to believe. Believe in what? Anything but what the Bible says. So Jesus is put on a par with a cosmic Christ who satisfies them all. And the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world is being equated with corpses that are still in their graves. Whereas the tomb of Christ is empty. So the second point, by legislation and by just general concepts, is negated in the world today. Verse 5 says, by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So here was a person who did not see death but was translated and taken away. Who believes that today? Who believes in a literal translation for the just at the end of time? And those that see death, that they will have a literal resurrection. Is there anybody that believes that today? But if you go into the broad spectrum of the world out there, do they believe it? Yes or no? No? They spiritualize it away. It's not a fact. It's not a pillar. So we have a problem here. Three pillars, and the world does not believe them, but they have faith. No, they don't have faith. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And without faith, it is impossible to believe him. Jesus said he will come again, and then the dead shall rise. But Enoch will not be amongst them. Why not? Because he's there already. Who else won't be amongst that crowd? Moses, why not? Because he had a special resurrection. We read it in the book of Jude. And that is why Moses... And Elijah, who had the same experience as Enoch, could appear on that Mount of Transfiguration. Who believes that today? In this lecture series, I will show that the theologians of the world do not believe this anymore. None of them virtually believes it. Here and there, there's a spattering of people that will stand up and stand for these truths and if they do they are ridiculed absolutely ridiculed see without faith it is impossible to please him 
And as we go through the list here, we're finding that we have more and more of a problem. By faith, verse 7, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. He believed God. God said there's a flood coming and this flood will destroy the world. Build yourself a boat. Get into the boat. I will seal you into the boat. The animals will come. They will go in two by two and seven pairs of clean, one pair of unclean and I will save these for posterity. <laughs> Who believes that today? Which churches officially embrace this theology? Help me. Help me. So by faith, the world was created by God's word and not by evolution. By faith, there is only one means of salvation. Works cannot save you. If you do not have the Son, you do not have life. If you do not have the Son of God, you don't have eternal life. There will be a translation. There will be a resurrection. And there is no such thing as a ghost on the other side. This is, by the way, a Sadducee teaching. But never mind, let's not go there. And then there was a universal flood. What a nightmare. The churches today are packed with people that have a form of godliness, but they don't believe the pillars of faith. Not one of these points. And yet they have a religious experience. And the less they believe these things, the greater their religious experience. Something must be off. Something must be off. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out, I like this next piece, not knowing where he was going. The removal truck moves up, the guys come and he says, take the furniture, put it in the removal truck. Where are we going, sir? I don't know. It's incredible. And here you have to go and you don't know where you're going. That's the Christian journey. Are you prepared to come out and go not knowing where you will be going? And eventually you come and you, where do you end up? You end up in a desert. And there you stand in the desert and you say, well, <laughs> what's this all about, Lord? Hey. And Mrs. Abraham starts chatting away and says, what have you done to me? <laughs> you know, how nice it was in Ur. Oh, what a magnificent place. I mean, the television was there, the theaters, the education, the kids could be educated in the best environment, in the best schools. What are you doing to me? We all have to come out by faith. Is anybody doing that today? Leaving father, mother behind. Leaving all those things which are your anchor in life and separate yourselves from them for the sake of the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. If you don't believe, you will never come out of the world. The draw of the world is far greater today than faith. People want faith. They want to be accepted by God, but they don't accept the conditions. They don't fulfill any of the prerequisites. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Here he lived. 
He changed his house for a tent. I mean, my poor wife had to live in a tent for three months. Three months! And then someone came along and said, I like your well. <laughs> and I had to move and live in a tent again for three months. Well, once it was literally in a tent, the next time it was in a caravan. Now she's got a house, but she's not allowed to live in it <laughs> because we're never there. Life's a misery. But it's interesting. And then it says here, why? For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now I want you to think about that for a while. Here is Abraham. He's the father of those who believe. And he came out of his comfort zone and he went to wheresoever I do not know where I'm going. All I know is that he whom I believe in has called me. That's the only thing I have. And instead of going to a mansion, he goes to the desert. And he's happy with that because he is waiting for a city whose maker and builder is God. Now if we take the general theology of the world today, who believes that? Help me. No one? No one? What do they believe? They believe they have to be the maker and the builder, so they resurrect the nation, and they're going to build a temple, and they're going to make a city whose maker and builder is man. And then we'll help God <laughs> with his promise. Because that's the only way we're going to see it, right? Because we want to touch it. We want to feel it. We want to experience it. Our faith is real substance. I can sit in it. I can touch it. I can feel it. That's what I want. I don't want evidence of things not seen. I want evidence of things I can see. I want to see it by observation. I don't want to believe it will happen. I want it now. I want to feel my connection with God. What did we hear this morning? What did Martin Luther say? Faith is not in feeling. Faith is not in feeling. Because if it were in feeling, then it would no longer by definition be faith. Faith is something you cannot see, something you cannot touch, but it is by faith as real as though you can feel it and touch it. See the subtle difference? So here we have today millions of people sitting in churches experiencing God. I want to know, Lord, that you are there and that I have a personal connection with you. Show it to me so that I may know that it exists. Give it to me. I want to feel it. Speak in tongues. Thank you. Fall over. Have holy laughter. Have gold dust fall down on my head. Whatever it takes. I want to physically see you, Lord, appear to me. Let's go there. Let's visualize it. Let's make it tangible. Let's make it touchable. Question. Are people having those experiences? Yes or no? Absolutely. That's what religion has become. This is the religion of the day. This is what the world believes. But unfortunately, it's not faith. Faith has been changed into reality. 
And then, by definition, it is no longer faith. And if it is not faith, then it is impossible to please him. No, even worse, it's sin. If you do not believe the pillars of faith, then you don't have faith. Today, our young people are afraid to be different. It's uncomfortable to be different. We sit and we say, well, you know, we want to be like the others. And peer pressure brings us to have this experiential religion. And we're afraid to say who we are or what we stand for. Why? Because you will be ridiculed. You will be ridiculed. Personally, I've been ridiculed for taking a stand on the very first pillar of faith. I was ostracized from the university, ridiculed by my colleagues, because I was so stupid to believe the first pillar of creation, let alone the one about the flood. <laughs> and were some of these church members? Yes. Some of them were pastors in churches and they were scientists at the same time and some of them were elders. I asked the one elder in a church, a geologist, what do you do with the verse where it says Jesus speaking and when the flood came it took them, what's this verse to say? all away he says well Jesus was mistaken he actually went further than that he said or he was lying but he's an elder in the church by faith by faith you have to grab hold of the promises you have to believe that God is that he exists and the world will not be perfect. You will have to go from Ur, which is utopia, right into the desert, not knowing where you are going. And the circumstances will be piled up against you. And we look at everybody pressing in and saying, that's a nice well you've dug. I'll take it, thank you very much, and make your life impossible until you move on to your next well and your next well and your next well until God, by His grace, might give you peace. We don't see it. We hope for it. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. And by faith he dwelt in this land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. He got nothing. Who wants to have a religion of getting nothing these days except a promise? Isn't that incredible? For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He was waiting for the advent, the second advent. Is it uncomfortable to have a simple faith like that today? Does it stand out? Is it unacceptable? I like the next one in particular. It's very encouraging. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. <laughs> How faithful did she judge him? She was a pillar of faith, right? What did she do? She had a good old giggle. 
when he said, you will bear a child, she laughed. And when she was rebuked, she denied it. She denied it. And so I assume from the text that she believed it a little bit like a mustard seed. And eventually it grew. And finally the child of promise was there. And she must have been grateful for what had happened. But it's not the power and the might or the greatness of our faith. All we need is a little faith. But then if we have a little faith, we must pray like the disciples prayed. And they said, Lord, increase my faith. We start like Sarah. Small little bit of faith. And it's hard. And you have to act on the faith. But if God is supposed to pour out all of these miraculous happenings in our life so that we can have spiritual formation, which as we will see, is touching, feeling, making a reality of that which is supposed to be faith, then we are actually sinning. Actually sinning. Therefore from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky and multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. Nobody would accept that today. Nobody would accept any of this today. They would go to a fertility clinic. I'm not saying that it's wrong to go to a fertility clinic. I'm just saying that this is an example of what faith is under the circumstances. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. Well, that must be the most horrendous verse in the Bible. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. This must be the most uncomfortable, the most miserable faith in the world compared to what faith is today on this planet. I would like to challenge you to come out from amongst them, to take God by his word, and no matter whether you go to the desert, no matter whether you lose home, whether you lose family, whether you get or whether you don't get, to take God at his word. Because all his promises are yea and amen. He will take care of all your needs. Is it even possible that you could be quite well off and comfortable as a Christian? Is it possible? Absolutely. Job was very comfortable. And then the Lord allowed that, how much be taken away? Everything. And when he restored him, how much did he get back? Multitudinous times more. Does that give us the right to preach a prosperity gospel, yes or no? No. Because he wasn't dependent upon it, and that was the point. He wasn't dependent upon it. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Praise be the Lord. If we have that attitude, if we have learned the lessons, it is possible that God will do more than take care of all our needs. But if it is gone, our faith should not falter. It should remain exactly the same. No, it should even become stronger in adversary than it was in prosperity. Otherwise, it's not faith. So I'm not preaching a gospel of abject poverty and groveling. Not at all. But I'm preaching a gospel of faith. No matter what happens. No matter what the circumstances, God has not changed. 
the circumstances have changed. And no matter what happens, we have to cling to the pillars of faith. And we have to stop being shy about what we believe. We believe the word of God. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Our faith is not in feeling. Our faith is in truth. I'd like to read you a quote. It comes from Testimonies, Volume 5. It is no time to be ashamed of our faith. We are a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. The whole universe is looking with inexpressible interest to see the closing work of the great controversy between Christ and Satan. At such a time as this, just as the great work of judging the living is to begin, shall we allow unsanctified ambition to take that possession of the heart? What can be of any worth to us now except to be found loyal and true to the God of heaven? What is there of any real value in the world when we are on the very borders of the eternal world? What education can we give to students in our schools that is so necessary as a knowledge of what saith? the scriptures we are living in the most fascinating times in the history of man it is not only possible it is probably likely that we will have to give up everything our homes are not our homes our security is not our security our jobs are not our security. Martin Luther said, If I know that he comes tomorrow, I will plant a tree today. That's sound advice. Carry on living. Do what you have to do. Don't do stupid things. Run off and give up everything because this is it now. And become some weird group of people <laughs> there in the world. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. So this is what I would suggest. Do what is right and leave the consequences to God. And if the circumstances should so dictate it that you have to choose between what the world considers right and what God considers right, it would be best to stand on the side of God. And then let the chips fall as they may. And then we need real faith. Then our faith will be tested and tried in the fire of affliction to see if it has substance. Not substance to augment my faith, but to show that my faith has substance. Whether it can stand the fire of affliction. May God help us as we contemplate these things. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 15 says, As your faith is increased. So God allows these little things to happen. And I'm sure... That everyone who walks with God has affliction. Because if you are in Christ, then you will have tribulation. Doesn't the Bible say that? You will have tribulation. So my encouragement to you today is, if you don't have a problem, then you really have a problem. <laughs> How do I use it? Unbelief says we can never surmount these obstructions. Let us wait till they are taken out of the way. Faith takes hold of the circumstance 
and moves ahead irrespective. Faith can move mountains. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench <laughs> how many darts of the wicked one? All the fiery darts of the wicked ones. We must take the shield of faith. And please understand that what the world has is not faith. It's substance. And we need substance of things hoped for. Not things that we experience right now. We will experience miracles. But miracles of a different order. Miracles that the world might not wish to have or miracles that they might not wish to understand. Stay grounded in your faith. Stay steadfast in your faith, says Colossians. And do not deny the faith. It says in 1 Timothy 5 verse 8, we may not, we dare not deny the faith. No matter what the pressure. And the pressure will come. The pressure will come and say, are you insane? Why do you not want to work together with everyone else? We are building the kingdom of God in the earth. No, I'm not waiting for a kingdom of God in the earth. I'm waiting for a heavenly city whose builder and maker is God. I don't want another city. The cities of this planet have bad sewage. I want a new one. Totally new. 1 Timothy 1 verse 19 says, hold on to your faith. 2 Timothy 4 verse 7, he says, keep it. Don't let it go. Don't let anything happen to your faith. We need faith now more than we ever needed it before. We are on the testing ground. We're in the final straight. For whatever is born of God, says 1 John 5 verse 4, whatever is born, born of God overcomes the world doesn't become part of it and this is the victory that has overcome the world our faith true faith true prayer how strong they are you know we pray and we pray and we pray and we don't see it happening but God knows and when we pray we accept that God has heard that prayer and will answer it in His way, in His time. We must practice faith every day because if we haven't got it, we cannot please Him. And without it, we will be lost because the winds of change are blowing and the circumstances are becoming worse and worse. And the only thing that will keep that smile on your face is faith. May God bless you as you contemplate these issues. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, like the disciples, we wish to pray, increase our faith. And Lord, show us that your faith has substance in the reality of that which you have promised which none of your pillars have yet received. They are waiting in the dust for that great day when the heavens will be rolled back as a scroll and the Son of Righteousness with healing upon his wings will appear with power and glory and all those saints that you have been waiting for to receive will come forth with shouts of glory. And those that are alive will be transformed in the twinkling of an eye. And angels will come and pick them up and take them to the sea of glass. Help us to believe it, to internalize it, to make it a reality. So that whatever winds of doctrine blow, we will not be moved. Help us to set our face like flint so that we may stand in the midst of the storm and the tempest knowing that the fourth man in the fire 
is by our side. In Jesus' name, amen.